This is the Emerging Technologies session, if, in case you didn't know, and uh, obviously the, the title uh, will betray the fact that we're going to be chrononauts this afternoon. We're going to be traveling into the future. Here's an idea for you, just a harebrained idea. Cause a stir. You, you run into a crowded place and you shout out, what year is it? And when someone tells you, you run out shouting, yes, it worked! <laughs> Well, I just thought, you know, it might, it might be interesting to see what the results, response might be. But, uh, but yes, we are interested in the future. Everyone's interested in the future, and um, mainly because we don't know what's going to happen next, but we know that something is going to happen, and we're going to be going that direction. So to help us and to guide us in that thinking, we have a, a great uh, speaker this afternoon, Dave Kelly, who's from uh, the eLearning Guild. He's the executive director of the eLearning Guild. Uh, he likes to say, so think of himself as the Donald H. Taylor of America. <laughs> That's what he told me, anyway. I, I don't know whether that's wise or not, uh, Dave, but, but we'll, we'll see. And um, he's going to be talking now about this very issue in front of you here. So would you give a warm welcome to Dave Kelly? Thank you. Um, I, I actually... Two, two things in response to what Steve said. One, um, way to set a nice expectation of best session of the day. Um, I'll, I'll bring that expectation down over the next hour that we're together. Uh, and also, I only describe myself as, as kind of the Don Taylor in the United States because I'm tired of it going to family parties and answering, so what exactly do you do? Uh, because it's hard to explain what you do around doing these different types of events. But in, in many ways, Don and I have very similar um, responsibilities. I run uh, an organization called the eLearning Guild, which does conferences like you have here in the United States, exploring the same sorts of topics. How, are t how is technology changing our approach as learning professionals within this industry? Um, and as I started to put the, together a deck for the conversation here today, and first off, I do encourage this to be a conversation. Um, at any given point, if you have a thought or anything like that, just flag me down, become part of this conversation, ask a question, add your feedback, um, because one of the things I think is very important within this conversation is that it be just that, a conversation. There is no one right answer to the what's going on with learning technologies in the future. You, there are, you listen to marketing campaigns and such, it's their job to tell you that this is the, this is the topic that is going to change your world as you go in the future and you need to be paying attention to this because it's going to change your world because I want you to buy my product. That's just the nature of marketing. Um, but the context of what makes something the right or the wrong decision is very personal. It's very personal to you as an individual. It's very personal to you as an organization. And what I want to help people do is understand what the opportunities are as it relates to different technologies so that you can apply that knowledge to your own context. I'm not here to say whether something is a good or a bad idea. I might give my own personal opinions on those different things, but I will preface it as saying this is where I, how I personally feel about it, but your, your opinion may be different based on the context of you and your own individual organizations. Uh, another thing you will not hear me say during this session is the word dead. You will hear a lot in, the, in terms of the, the learning technology space, a lot of times the conversation surrounds, this is going to replace classroom training. Classroom training is dead. This is going to replace e-learning. E-learning is dead. Nothing, nothing's dying. We may not necessarily use it as much as new technologies emerge that are more applicable to the context of our situation, but it's just adding tools to the existing belt. Nothing is going away and nothing is necessarily wrong as long as you're implementing it properly. So with that old foundation in place, I started to put together the, the visuals that are attached to my talk here today. And I started with the obvious fortune teller, looking into a crystal ball, trying to gaze what's going on in the future so that she can see and tell you what's going on. And I thought, well, yeah, that's a little cliche. Maybe I should go for something that's a little bit, this is a learning technology space. Maybe I should go for something that's a little bit more technical in nature. Oh, before I show you the next slide, I want to point out one URL. I'll show this again at the end. Uh, this URL will take you to a page on my blog that has all the slides, a number of resources that you can take advantage of to learn more about some of the stuff. Some of the things that I will talk about today, uh, the resources will be on that page, as well as an, a host of additional resources that you can use to continue learning about this topic as you go forward. And I'll show that URL at the end, again at the end. Uh, so. The, 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 the fortune teller is a little cliche. I wanted to go a little bit more technical. So I said, well, maybe I can go for 
something like that, where the crystal ball is the earth and we have all these different technologies that are surrounding it. And then I started thinking about the conversations that I often hear around the learning technology space and how this technology is gonna change the game, it's gonna radically alter everything that we do, it's gonna, the world of the learning professional is gonna be completely different five years from now. The world of the, the, the training department is at risk because of this ch change that is coming down the pike. And the more I hear about that stuff, which I will put under the general heading of crap, um, that's where I started thinking, well, maybe what I need to go to is a visual that better represents that overall conversation, which would essentially be a blindfolded monkey throwing darts. But the reality is, I go back to what I said earlier, this is a conversation we need to be having. Not to say that your world is going to be, if you're not prepared for it, your world is going to end. Every organization's context is unique, every individual's context is unique. However, what we all have the responsibility to do is to be aware of what's going on around us so that we can prepare ourselves for it. And that's the conversation that I want to lead you through over the next hour or so. And there's a little bit of perspective on it. We are changing. One of the things that was also interesting is I put this slide together and I started thinking about the conversation of what it means to be exploring the learning and technology space. I found myself pausing at the very early stages of putting together this talk. And I thought, what's the title of my talk? which is a little bit of an alarming statement to be making. But it was a real specific reason for it, because I thought about it. There's a specific word that I was thinking. Is it in the title of my session? Because I want to present two different titles to you. One is, a look ahead, the now and next of learning technology. And another one, a look ahead, the now and next of learning and technology. What's the title of this session, first or second one? I hear some people cautiously saying second. It is the second. Why does, this, why does this matter? It's three little letters, one word. But it's three little letters, one word that completely changes the scope of how I would have approached this session. Because the, the, a look ahead at what's going on with learning and technology, those are two separate topics, how people learn and what's going on in technology. And if you put those two words together and say learning technology, it's not the sum of the two together. We have this phrase that we use, learning technologies, but if you go downstairs to the exhibition hall and you walk around to all the different vendors that are providing tremendously valuable services to our organizations, and you think about it, they're not really the majority of them learning technologies companies. They're educational technology companies. That's not a bad thing, but it's an important differentiation between what we, and what we need to understand as people who call themselves learning professionals. The scope of our work is expanding so that we really embrace what learning professional means. And I can think of no better example when I think of the differences between learning and education than this kid. He's my son. He, he's sitting there, this is Christmas morning, and he got the little BB-8 robot thing from the Star Wars movie, and he loves it. It's his favorite little toy from Christmas. And if you're not familiar with it, it's a little robot thing that you control with your smartphone. And that morning, was very, I always, I'm always interested in looking at the world through his eyes, because he doesn't carry the baggage that I do with me. And he was playing with it, and he said, I want, you know, and I saw him doing something, and I said, and I said well, what are you trying to do? He's like, I wanna, I'm going to go on YouTube. I said, why? He said, I want to find out how to do something. And I looked over at the box, I said, there's an instruction manual in there. He said, I know, but I want to go on YouTube. It's going to show me how to do it better. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to do that. And it wasn't that he was six and he didn't want to read the instructions. It was that that was just a natural thing for him. And then he discovered the fact that he could not use the, the toy while watching a YouTube video on the same device. Hit that barrier. So his, so his solution to that was, Dad, I need your phone. Because he was using his mother's phone. I said, you know, your mother's a little, I'm on one end of the tech spectrum where I'm like, tech can solve everything and let's, let's adopt all the tech we can. And my wife is on the other end of the spectrum of tech is evil sometimes and we need to learn how to live without it. So the idea of my wife walking in the room and seeing my six-year-old with two smartphones in his hand, not going to go well for me. So I said, no, you, no, you can't do that. Watch the video and then you'll watch the, then you, then you can try it out and you can just do one after the other. And I leave the room and I come back and I hear the video playing this instructional video and it's really, really loud. Like way too loud for a smartphone. I walk in, I'm like, what are you doing? And I look and he's got the thing in his hand and he's using the app to control it and he had put the video on YouTube using the smart TV. And, and I was just like, this is how he's naturally just figuring things out. 
And, as I lo- and then the other thing that I found fascinating was afterwards, I, I go back to the box as we start putting it away, and I come across this instruction manual that is still sealed in the plastic that he has never opened. And I opened it. And I flipped through, and it's a page and a half that gives you hardly any instructions whatsoever. And it, and it dawned on me that that's pretty common nowadays. That, you know, I remember when I, I'm, a, I'm a gamer, and I used to buy a video game, and the instruction manual was like this thick. I told you how to do everything. Now games don't even come with an instruction manual because they just f- assume you're going to figure it out or they're going to structure it in a way that you can figure things out because they know people aren't using these manuals as a way to learn how to play the game. So the way we learn in life is changing. And that's one of the things I think is most important for learning professionals to realize. We talk about this idea of what's going on with learning technology and how is this going to change the world of the learning professional. And we focus on what we're doing. We focus on our space of the learning and development industry as the place to watch to find out what's going on with learning technologies. And that's a mistake. Because the reality is if you want to find out what's going on with how technology is going to change the way people learn, you have to watch how technology is changing the way people live. Because that's going to trickle down to our world. It's not a matter of how is technology going to change the world of the learning professional or change the way learning is. It's going to change the way we live. You think of these smartphone devices, how they have fundamentally changed the way that we interact with the world around us, how we connect with each other, how we connect with information online. It has fundamentally changed it. The learning profession and the education profession is catching up to that because the world has already changed around us. And that's not a problem, that's just the nature of life. You're not gonna, we're not gonna be able to force a change, technological change on people if they haven't adapted to it. And a lot of times the technology is gonna change the way we live our daily lives and learning is gonna adapt to that. And it's that flavor of discussion that I'm going to be talking about as we dive into some of these specific technologies. Any questions as we start this conversation? Any, any expectations that you had coming into this session today, which is really nothing more than me giving myself an excuse to take a drink? What reasons did you have? What, what types of things were you hoping to discover in the session here today? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Catching up, as you said earlier, about the kids doing tech, we look at that and think, how the hell did that happen? <laughs> we just got to get ahead of the curve. You know? Yeah, absolutely. If you didn't hear it in the other side of the room, it's, it's essentially we're, we're consistently behind the curve, and how can we stay ahead of it? Absolutely. Any other thoughts? Well, that's going to be a major theme of what we're going to be talking about here today. So what I want to spend the majority of the time that we have here today is diving into some of these specific technologies and exploring what's going on with them and how it could affect to change. Is that your hand somewhere? Okay. A little dark on that side. If you have any, again, if you have any questions or anything, just grab my attention. Feel free to interrupt me. I don't consider it rude. I consider it adding to the value of the session. So this discussion that we're going to have today is not really about technology. It's not even really about learning. So, but please don't leave. Uh, what this discussion is really about is about disruption. It's about where technology is changing the ways that we live and how it's changing the ways that we learn. We hear the word disruption. First off, it's a buzzword, and I really resist using buzzwords unless it's specifically contextual, and in this particular case, I think it is. Uh, But a a disruption is not a bad thing. We tend to associate disruption with it's it's a bad thing. It's taking what we like and, and making it go away. It's shaking my snow globe, which is a phrase that a lot of people use as if it's a negative thing. Change is not bad, it's just change. We have the opportunity to determine whether or not the changes that disrupt our status quo are positive or negative. So what we're gonna be talking about today are things that are disrupting the status quo of how we live and also some that are how we're gonna be talking about uh, things that are disrupting how we work. Another thing I think is important to realize within this discussion, um, I'm not talking 10, 20 years out. I'm talking now, maybe five years out total in terms of what we're talking about. Um, And again, it's all contextual. Some of the stuff that I'm talking about that I say is five years out, you, your organization may be an early adopter and is already playing in the space. Other stuff that I say is five years out, you might be an organization that it might be 10, 15 years out. For those of you that were in the keynote session today, we heard about an organization which was not unique that was talking about bringing their classroom training down from 97% to 94%. That's that's the context of that organization and that's that's where their yardstick is set. That's not positive or negative, it's just, that's where they're at. So 
I'm going to be talking about it where I see the generalities, but your particular context might be a little different. So when we talk about disruption, let's put it in context a little bit. We talk about, there are very, lots of stakeholders that, as it involves um, when it comes to disruption. So I want to put one in the context that most of us can understand. How many of you are still doing traditional training in your organization? Just about every hand in the room goes up. Most of us are doing some level, or at least if you're not doing it, you, your organization did it at one time. And then somewhere in the 90s, early 2000s, depending on your organization, the computers started broaching in. And we had this first disruption to the world of the trainer that we call generally e-learning. And it shook things up a lot. And it was a disruptive force. But the question I have for you is, who was e-learning disruptive to? Who do you find it? Wow, I ask a question and they <laughs> shut the lights out. Nice. Well played. The learner right here. Any, sorry? Teachers. Anyone else? You fit on two of the three that I was going to touch on. Organizations, yeah. So let's go through each of these. So first off, who was it disruptive to? The learners. Now, disclaimer, this picture lies. I develop e-learning. I love e-learning. I think it's a valuable tool when done right. I have never in the history of my career seen someone that happy to take an e-learning course. Uh, so it, it, it lies, but it gets the point across. It was really, really disruptive. We, are, we, have, we have a lot of baggage that we carry when it applies to this idea of learning or education. When I tell someone that they are going to learn something, there's an expectation that is ingrained in them through life about what that experience is going to be looking like. If I tell you you need to learn something, there's an expectation that's attached to that that someone's going to teach me something. That, that, that expectation has been just hammered into us through 12 plus years of school as a child. That we have this expectation that there is an expert, a teacher, who's going to teach me something. And more than likely, it's going to be in a classroom style environment. And now, we've completely disrupted that paradigm and said, no, you're going to sit down in front of this computer and hit, you know, in, in the early days, you're just going to click a next button forever. Uh, but now we're getting starting some of this social engagement involved in it, which is great, some of the stuff we're doing today. But you're going to use a computer to do it. And it was extremely disruptive to the, to the learner. I, I'm, not, I'm not wired that way. I'm not used to that being in my experience. I'm used to having a teacher teach me how to do things. Very disruptive. Another one that I heard that it was, in, it was disruptive to the instructional designers or the trainers. I know how to work Word and, and work in my template and, and put my facilitator guide together for my classroom. Now you want me to put something together in this e-learning module. It's a completely different world. It's a different skill set. Some of you are looking around this room and I'm realizing my own age. Some of you look too young to remember this transition. Um, but for people like myself who had to go through that transition, it was painful. Really painful to, 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 it was a totally different world to have to suddenly take what you've applied in the classroom and find a way to do it in, in an e-learning environment. Very disruptive to the, to the trainers and the instructional designers of the world. And it was also very disruptive to organizations that we had this expectation of what training was and now we're saying it's going to look different. And it's going to, rather than everyone has the expectation that we're going to come to a classroom for any time there's a learning need and we're going to go through this workshop. Now you're going to be able to sit in front of a computer and do it on your own without a teacher. Very disruptive to organizations. Organizations latched onto it for the wrong reasons because it saved a lot of money, but it was disruptive to the status quo. So what we're going to be talking about today are, is it all, everything that we're going to be talking about, the specific technologies, is diving into that sort of context of how it's disruptive to us as learners, to us as trainers, to us as organizations. So let's pop in. First one. Because the reality is, you haven't seen anything yet. If you think e-learning was disruptive, the stuff that's coming down the pipeline is going to be a similar disruption that is going to shake up our world. And we need to be ready for it. So let's talk about some of these things. Some of these, and I'm going to start, I've tried to arrange these. Again, contextually, it's different for each organization. But in terms of a timeline of when they're coming, some of them are now, little ones are, some of them are a little further out. So let's talk with the one that's probably the most ubiquitous to the people in the room, multi-device learning. How many of you are developing for multiple devices now? Good percentage of people in the room. Um, this is, the we used to talk about it from the standpoint of mobile, you know, mobile learning or M-learning or getting stuff on the device. 
Um, there's, it's the default now. Most, the major, a lot of, depending on the, the, the statistics and stuff that you read, the majority of consumption is taking place not on a desktop anymore. It's taking place in a handheld, whether it be a tablet or a mobile device. We have to play in that space. And we have to play in that space in ways that is different than the ways we've played before. Mobile is probably the most contextual in this space, but what I'm about to say applies to every new technology. We have a wonderful habit in our industry of taking old methodologies and shoehorning them into new technologies. We approach new technologies with the wrong question. We approach it with the standpoint, we, we tend to approach new technologies with the question of how does this new technology, how do I do what I do with this new technology? How do I take what I do and apply it to this new technology? That is the wrong question because it is a very closed-minded approach to a technology. What we need to be doing is looking at any new technology and say, how does this new technology change what I do? How does it, what are the opportunities? What can I do with this new technology that I have never been able to do before to enhance a learning experience, to create performance support initiatives? That's a different question. It's a different mindset to approach new technologies. And it's the, one, and it's the type of question and the type of mindset that is going to break us free of this pattern of shoehorning old methodologies into new technologies. Mobile is probably the most current example of that. The mobile conversation, depending on the organization that you're in, has been around for about a decade, about this idea of mobile learning. And where it started was for, last, for, a lot, for, for most organizations, they start from a standpoint of how do, I get, how do I do what I do on that device? How do I get this desktop content on this device in an appropriate way? And that's where this, this focus on responsive design came in. A lot of the tools that are out there that we use to develop e-learning today are now leaning towards a responsive design, which is a good thing. It, having the content appear in a way that's appropriate for the device that you have, that's a good thing. But it's not enough. Because what that's saying is, how do I take this experience that you have on a desktop and get it accessible on a mobile device? That's not exploring the possibilities of it. It's not exploring the unique things that a device can do that your desktop cannot. We're talking about, now you're starting to see a shift in the mobile space, in the multi-device space, from responsive learning to adaptive learning that is taking, more advan taking advantage of the unique aspects of the, this device, like, it, like the fact that it has a GPS that knows where you are at any given moment, like the fact that it has a camera, like the fact that it is, you are walking around literally with a device that is connected to the limitless information of the internet. What does that mean? And that's the type of stuff that we need to be exploring. That's, what's, that's what excites me about the mobile learning conversation. I've been engaged in it for a number of years, and we're just starting to see the shift again. We, 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 get, we got to the point that, that the, the ability to access the content that we have on mobile, there's a normalization point hitting with that. And now we're starting to see the examples of organizations saying, well, what can we do in, be doing more? You, you hear the idea of mobile first. That's, a, that's another buzzword that's out there. But essentially, what the question is, what can we be doing with these devices that we've never been able to do before? And we're starting to see examples of people who are using these as self-guided orientations where you don't have to be walked around the facility. The, 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 the device will guide you to it. And, it will, and, as, and as, the, as the new hire who's, who's doing a self-guided tour throughout the facility approaches my office, my device gets pinged and says, the new hire is gonna get in your vicinity, you should be ready. It's one of the, there's, there's a huge amount of potential around multi-device learning to do things we've never been able to do before. We talk about learning, one of the most powerful things about learning and education is to make it contextual to people. That's gonna make it real, that's gonna make it tactile for them. What's more contextual than a device that is with you all the time, knows where you are, and has the ability to communicate with other things? Very, very powerful, and we're just starting to see some of the, some of the real examples of harnessing the potential of multi-device learning in ways that is more than just accessing the content. Anyone, anyone doing anything like that today? Love to hear an example of it. Okay, let's, yeah, I see a hand all the way to back. Mm -hmm. So helping Absolutely. Beacons are beacons are a tremendous technology this. One of the things that I'm always looking at, again, going back to that phrase of you want to see how technology is going to change the way people learn, you follow how technology is changing the way people live. 
And I walk through the mall at home, and more and more frequently I'll walk past the store and I'll get a pop-up that says, hey, here's a coupon code to get this sort of thing. The, the phone, I, I have it set up that I can accept a beacon signal, and the phone recognizes the beacon, and it, and it prompts me with a symbol. What is, that, what is that notification, that little beacon connection doing? It's affecting my behavior. It's trying to get me to change my behavior from walking this way to walking inside with my wallet, preferably. That's what we want to find out how to affect change with technology. Look at how marketing is, is doing it. And, and be, have your ideas sparked by that. So yeah, thank you for that example. Beacons are a, a tremendously powerful example of multi-device learning being used contextually. And again, these are not, we don't, this is not a, a mobile learning discussion anymore. Multi-device means just device agnostic. A lot of the stuff in the content space right now, not necessarily within, you don't hear this conversation as much in the learning and development space, but if you follow just content space in general, like web design space, um, how people are designing content for the web, the, the content now is being de designed in a way that it is device agnostic, that it is not something that you're designing for a device, you're designing content so that it is device agnostic, so that it is clean data that can be ported into any device in an appropriate way. And you're seeing a lot of that in the web design space. And again, I'm not talking about the, the you're, gonna, you're gonna hear me go off on these tangents about saying you can learn this from this space, you can learn that from that space. If we insulate ourselves as learning professionals and only learn from each other, we're not gonna grow. We've gotta start looking outside of our space for inspiration and ideas and see what other people are doing to, to, to affect our practices. Next one, data and analytics. How many of you have heard of a little phrase called big data? How many of you, keep your hands up if you know what it means. <laughs> big data is one of the most overused phrases that I've ever heard uh, in recent years. Um, because the, 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 and the reason I say that is, first off, I hate buzzwords because my definition of a buzzword is the usage of a word that spreads faster than the understanding. And that's what big data is. It's a buzzword. Everybody's talking about it. Nobody knows what the hell they mean. And part of the challenge in my, war, in, in my opinion is that we're focusing on the wrong word. We're focusing on the big part of it. It's not about how big the data is. It's about our ability to crunch the numbers. That is what really matters when it comes to big data. It's not about how much, I mean, data, part of the big data thing is the size of it. The fact that we have sensors everywhere that are generating data at levels we have never seen before and it's only getting bigger. So yes, the big part of the big data <laughs> equation is an important component, but it's not the critical part. The critical part is still the data. The critical part is still the computers that have the ability to analyze the data. How many of you were in the session, who, the, the earlier speaker today? Yes, how many were in that session earlier? So an example about Watson was one of the ones that we saw earlier today. That's an, if, you haven't familiar, if you're not familiar with Watson, Watson's a great example of it. It is a computer that learns, it is able to crunch an amount of data in ways that we have never seen before. Like many of you probably saw, I don't know if it was as popular here uh, in Europe as it was at, at, at home in the States, but a couple of years ago, the Watson computer, when you first heard about it, was around Jeopardy, the game show Jeopardy. And they had these two experts, the best players ever in the world, compete against Watson. They would, uh, Alex Trebek would read a question, and Watson would buzz in with a physical buzzer if it knew the answer, and it was right over 90% of the time. The two humans got completely trounced. Uh, and it was, and it was, it wasn't that Watson heard the had any unfair advantage other than like enormous processors and such, but it, it heard the question in the exact same real time as the humans did. Was able to do all the computations, searching all the different data that was available, contextually building it all together to give a real world, real world answer. And there were times that it was completely off, where it was just kind of like you know, it'd be like, what color is the sky? And it would come back and it would say, it's thirteen. And that was one of those things where you're just like, okay, well, the wires got crossed somewhere. But for the vast majority of the time, it's spot on. And it's only gotten better since then. That's where the power of the analytics comes in, is the ability to take this data and analyze it in ways to, to, to tell better stories. And that's the, that's the phrasing that I always use in the data discussion as it applies to learning and performance, is the ability to tell better stories. How many of you are familiar with XAPI or the Experience API or Tin Can or whatever they're calling it this week? So a bunch of hands come up. The, the, the common phrase for it now is the experience API. 
Um, that's the one that's getting the most attention within our space, uh, without question. And it's one that is g gaining a lot of traction in the learning and performance community. It's not the only data analytics game in town, especially for those of you coming from the higher ed community. You're probably aware that there are a lot, other, a lot of other ones that are available that are playing more in the academic space. But the XAPI one tends to be more uh, prevalent in the learning and development space within the uh, corporate space. Uh, but what this is, this, this is on the path to changing the expectation for what we generate in terms of a report as it applies to learning and performance within our organizations. And the reports that we generate as learning professionals, and I say this as, as a member of the group, for the most part, would also go under that heading of crap. Because they, they are generally how many people went through the course? What test scores did they get? How many people completed it by the time the compliance training deadline was met? These are not metrics of learning. These are not metrics that are actionable other than to get someone in trouble for not doing a required training course by the, de by the deadline. But XAPI is giving us different options. It's got the ability to track more information, different types of information, and to crunch it in ways that can tell us better stories. That can, we're getting, we, this has the potential for us to be talking about metrics that are more competency-based. That's really powerful for us. And this is not something, this is something that a lot of organizations are doing today. It's not mainstream in every single organization where SCORM is going away, and I don't see that happening in the very near term, but for a lot of the early adopting organizations, they are relying a lot heavily, a lot more heavily on this than they do SCORM, enabling us to do much, much more impactful things with their learning programs and to report on it and to be able to understand what's going on within their staff and within their populations than ever before. This is something that is coming. This is something that is already here in terms of the world. It's just not prevalent in a lot of learning and development organizations. Uh, some of the early adopters for XAPI are doing it. The vast, but this is something that whether you're interested in this or not, this is one that I will honestly say is coming, whether you like it or not. For the vast majority of organizations, this is going to come in the form of an IT application that comes in that has the ability to crunch numbers in a way that our software that we're using as learning professionals that we haven't updated does not. And there's just going to be a change in the expectation to say, I know you used to store it in the LMS, but we're going to start storing it here because we can, do, we can report on it in different ways. And it's going, to be, it's, and it's, going to be report, it's going to be part of a data set that is part of our larger HR portfolio. It's just going to happen. The question is, are we going to be ready to participate in that conversation? But data and analytics are something. How many of you are using XAPI now? Anybody? Yeah, that, that, about what I expected. XAPI is just one example, but the idea of data and analytics being used in a way to transform how we look at measuring learning within our organizations, that's coming. And I, I, it, may, it may take a little longer in different organizations, but it will happen because the world, as it, the world in general, how we look at data and the expectations attached to it is changing. Next one, a shift to performance support. How many of you are using performance support as part of your strategy? I see a few hands coming up. Um, performance support is, is I don't like the phrase. Um, I mean, I, I love the idea of performance support. I love the, the I, don't, I just don't like the phrase because you, go, you take the average trainer who's never heard of the phrase performance support and you say, do you do performance support? Well, yeah, I support performance through my e-learning and the training classes that I do. That's not performance support. Performance support is a different methodology and it's just the, the, the two words that we've chosen to describe it, while accurate, can be confusing to people who don't realize that it's being used to describe a different type of methodology. So why the shift to performance support? Um, organizations, I don't need to tell you this, but organizations are moving faster. You might have noticed that. There might be, you might have also noticed that the expectations in terms of your ability to deliver learning programs to satisfy an organizational need are shrinking because they want they, they, the organization, the, the idea that, the idea that I, I used to have as, as a person when I worked in different organizations that someone would come to me with a need and I would say, all right, no problem, I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna do my needs analysis and I'm gonna put together a pilot program and I'm gonna get it to you and we should be able to deliver this, start rolling this out to the masses in about two to three months. If I said that to an organization, say they, there's a lot of organizations that would laugh at me because I don't have time for that I don't have the, and you don't have time for that, that's not what we do here. The shift of performance support is the idea of looking towards how can we be less disruptive about giving people the support that they need. At a very base level, if you're not familiar with the performance support methodology, it's about finding less disruptive ways to give people the support that they need. It's about the, breaking the paradigm of you need to learn something, and in order to learn something, it means you have to stop working so that you can learn, so that you can go back and apply the new knowledge. 
Performance support breaks that paradigm completely and says, how can I get the person the support that they need in the moment while they're in the work? It is a minimalistic approach to supporting performance. And I, that, and I think that is a very, very important thing for us to be adapting in terms of the way that we see our work. We tend to, a lot of uh, subject matter experts and a lot of trainers, based on the experience that they have, tend to start with the, let's give them everything so that they've gotten what they need. If we cover everything, then we're covered and they'll be ready because we talked about everything. No, we all know that it doesn't work that way. <laughs> The, 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 the shift to performance support is represented by organizations that are saying, get people what they need and let them get back to work. Don't interrupt my salesperson, take them out of, the, out of the pipeline so that they can be trained. Give them the support, the job aids and such that they need so that they can get the information that they need while they're completing the sale, while they're on the phone with that customer. And there's a growing need within organizations to find approaches to do this. Because more and more, we have people that are in the field that are doing work in the field. They, are in, they have a problem that they're encountering in their work now, and they want to solve it now. And a lot of them are doing it on their own, whether it be going to YouTube or going to SharePoint and finding something, finding the resource. They're not going to the training department. They're doing it on their own. We, as learning professionals and learning and support professionals, need to be playing in that space more, to be looking, looking at any sort of a problem that needs to be solved and saying, what's the bare minimum that I could do here to solve that problem? And which is a really suspect phrase when you think about it. But it's not that you're trying to not do work. It's that you're trying to do the work that's appropriate. You're trying to find the way to solve the problem without blurring what the, what the problem is by <laughs> soaking it in sort of extraneous information that's not really needed. I'm not saying that there is not a need to give people comprehensive education. When you got a new hire, that is, I'll give you a, a, a very specific example. I used to, I spent a lot of my time in, in finance. How many, where are my, my people working in finance in the room? I'm sorry. Uh, I, know, I know the pain of compliance training in a financial world. Uh, I used to hire, I used to work in, uh, I used to tra train tellers, That's an example most people can be familiar with. Uh, and we would send them for a two week new hire training. And we, there was a specific transaction that we did. It was a, it was a redemption of a bond, a bond that I, when I was going through the training materials, I said, what is this bond? They said, oh, they're not that, there's not that many of them out there right now, but you know, they still exist, so people need to know how to, how to redeem them. I said, well, how many of them are out there? And they said, well, we're not, we, you know, we, we don't know. That comes from the Fed. I was like, how many, does, how many does the average branch redeem in a year? They probably get one of those every year. I said, so we're training people during new hire training on how to do a transaction that one out of the 10 people in the location that they get next year are going to have to encounter. What do you think the chances are of them actually remembering what we talked about here today when it was in the mix of a two-week training program? It was useless. It was completely useless. Flip that model, and th from a standpoint of performance sport, if you have this idea of what's the minimalistic approach, you would know that. You would never have let that get into a new hire training program. You would recognize the fact that there's no training that I could give someone that they are going to remember when they first encounter this transaction two years from now. You would start from the mentality of, I need to find a way to get the support on site that the person can get, find, know where to find it to get them that, to walk them through how to do this transaction at the time that they need it. And more and more organizations are starting to focus on that. Of the, of the need of don't waste time on training someone on an isolated task. Find, make sure that they have the support structure in place to get that in there. It's a space that a lot of learning professionals haven't played in before, but it's a shift in the expectations of how we deliver our work. More and more organizations are focused on this. <coughs> curation. How many of you are playing in the curation space? I see a hand somewhere? No? Not many. Okay. Curation is a growing need within our organization. I think, I've, I'm a big believer in curation. I think it's one of the core competencies that learning and development professionals need to be involved in for a number of different reasons. First off, curation plays in the space that I mentioned earlier of the need to deliver solutions faster. Curation also represents the world that we're living in now. And I don't mean to trivialize any of the work that any of us have done. But there is, depending on what statistic you look at, you hear, you hear, you've probably heard some level of the phrase that there will be more information created in the world in the next two weeks than has been created in the history of mankind at any point before it because of how much user-generated content there is online now. I don't know the statistical accuracy of that, but we've all heard some level of that phrase. Bottom line is we'll create a lot of content. And in a world where there's that much content being created, 
do you really think that no one has cracked your leadership development problem yet? That it's not that there that we need to create this 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 internal resource driven leadership development? No, chances are someone has already done what we what we need to do. We just need to go out and find it and repurpose it where possible. Again, there's a whole copyright discussion that we could go down, but curation is essentially is the idea of saying content creation through creation, uh, through curation, where we're looking for what the, where the resources are and bringing them in to the audience that needs them. And this is, a, this is also, there's a, there's a competency aspect of curation of literally making part of your practice, but there's also a mindset aspect of l asking yourself as part of the process is, has someone solved this problem before? At a bare minimum, of, I think a learning and development profession needs to be curating from the standpoint of chances, I can't tell you how many times that people have, I've been through, I've either done it myself or I've seen other people in organizations go through the process of creating a tra training program, rolling it out, and then finding out that, that they, go back to this, they go back to wherever their workplace is, the people who went through training, and they say, I know they, they showed you how to do that in training, but let me show you how we really do it here because they figured out loopholes and better ways to do things. And it stays within this pocketed silo of an organization. Curation is to be able to not just, not just to go to that person, not, well, not to go to that person and slap them on the wrist saying, what are you doing? Tell them to do something different than what we told them to do in training. To recognize that there's, there's a conversation that needs to be had there. To recognize that why are you doing it differently? What's the value that you got there? And if, it's, and if it needs to be corrective action, you can do that. But more importantly, if they've figured out a better mousetrap to elevate that, to a higher level of visibility so the entire organization can take advantage of it. That's what curation at its heart is, is to tap, your, tap, tap into the conversations that are going on in your organization and outside of your organization so that you can recognize this piece of information here has really good value to this person over here and connect the two. And we can do that really, really fast. I was, the, the last organization that I was with was a nonprofit. And we were, I, just, I distinctly remember, this is, this is where I got them all to buy into the idea of us leveraging curation a little bit more. Uh, we were sitting in a meeting and we were talking about this, this approach to how are we going to get people to understand the mission of the organization. It was a, an organization that supported uh, developmental, uh, individuals with developmental disabilities. And how do we get people connected to our mission, blah, blah, blah. Talking, and we were in one of those meetings that are, we've all been through them, where we're sitting there for an hour to talk about what we need to talk about and really getting nothing done. And as we were ending the meeting, as a lot of meetings end, which is, all right, well, you go do this, you go do that, you go do that, and we'll, then we'll have another meeting next week to talk about what we did, didn't talk about this week. I was, meantime, on my smartphone, tweeting out a couple of things and doing a couple of searches, and at the end, I said, well, before we leave, why don't we try this? And I just went to the computer, put in the URL that I had found on my phone, and I said, I, this is someone who's kind of solved our problem already. Why can't we just take that idea and implement it? Uh, not, not stealing that person's content, but it was a good idea. And it wasn't the one that was patented in any way. Why can't we just do that? That's curation. And we, we, yeah, great idea. Let's go do that. And we didn't have 19 different meetings to decide how we needed to develop an idea internally. We just found a good idea and were able to leverage it. We need to be doing more of that because it's going to enable us to deliver solutions faster. Because real reality is when it comes to curation, People are inundated with information. There's a phrase that's commonly used that if you're trying to uh, get information off, trying to get information off the internet is trying to take, like trying to take a drink out of a fire hose. And we need to help people sip. We need to look at the, the limitless pool of information that they are just getting hammered with all the time between email, subscriptions on, on online, social media, and to say, wait a minute, I know you got all this stuff going on, but here's something that's important, and here's why. Curation has a tr one of the phrases that I love uh, from Curation Nation, a book by Steve Rosenbaum. Uh, great book if you're interested in learning more about curation, is curation replaces, re curation replaces noise with clarity. And that's the environment that all of us are in right now. There's a lot of noise. And curation is a tremendous tool to replace the noise with clarity of message. And who better than the learning professional to play in that space? It's a, tr it's a great tool to add to your tool belt. It's not a, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of, tools that are out there that say that they are curation tools, they don't replace a human being. It's, 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 the, cur curation is not something that you can just automate within your organization. That's, that's not curation. Uh, you need, a, the curator is, is an individual that someone can trust within an organization. That if, you know, I have curators within our industry that, you know, 
that if someone tweets something that I look at as a curator, I'm, I'm going to say, you know what, the fact that they shared that, it has value. I want to I read what they shared. That same sort of thing can be applied within our, the context of our work. Next one, augmented reality and virtual reality. How many of you are playing in this space? I see, I see a hand? How are you playing with it? Mm -hmm. So I'm just practicing that. Uh, That's excellent, excellent. I saw another hand. Yeah. We did an experiment uh, with virtual reality with Oculus Rift about an F tube for our reader. A what? F tube. Oh, okay. Looking in the virtual reality glass as were you working in a sweatshop in India. Excellent, interesting. If you didn't hear that, that was, that was giving, people, giving the leaders in an organization a virtual reality experience of what it would be like to be in a sweatshop in India. Very immersive description. Uh, so there are a lot of examples of this. This is a tech that I think for most organizations are a little further out. Um, there is a, as much as the, the, the bar is being lowered in terms of the price of entry to get into this space and the ability to create content in this space is continuing to, to be lowered which is great. It's still a little bit out of reach for, for a lot of people, but there is tremendous potential for learning and development uh, within the augmented reality space. And you, if you walk through the, the exhibition downstairs, you'll see some examples of it. There is, there is a, a curiosity standpoint around augmented reality and virtuality. I think right now the conversation around it is more, this is really cool, than this is how we're gonna use this to solve a problem. But it's a technology that has a lot of money behind. It a, it's a technology that is eminently going to be impacting the consumer space. I mean, my son, for the holidays, because I'm his dad, got a Viewmaster re virtual reality toy for Christmas, where the, the same Viewmaster that I had as a kid, which I would pull this thing down and it would just go slide to slide to slide, now I have to give him my smartphone and that slips into it and he runs an app that he can do this to and it's a virtual reality experience. It's, a, it's impacting the consumer market. And it's going to change the way that we live in many different ways. That's going to naturally have extensions to learning. It, if, if you've never, I, I encourage you, if you've never experienced a virtual reality uh, headset, just for the experience of what augmented reality or virtual reality is like, there are plenty of exhibitors downstairs that are luring you to their booth by the fact that you can see this. Uh, take some time and check it out because it, it, once you see this virtual environment in, a, in, in action, you kind of get an idea of how immersive they can be. And there's tremendous applications for education and learning attached to that. Uh, keeping in mind, of course, augmented reality and virtual reality are two very different things. Um, virtual reality is the headset that most of us are familiar with that literally puts you somewhere else as compared to an augmented reality thing which is an overlay over the, the, the existing world which has even more power. How many, how many of you have ever seen um, an app, it's been around for a while, called WordLens? Which, uh, you, yeah, so I see some hands coming up. Google actually bought it. It's actually uh, something that Google is just implementing into it. But, just one of the most amazing, it, it's one of those things that it's so simple that when you see it in practice, it almost seems like magic. But it, it oper if you're not familiar with it, it, it operates on your smartphone and it operates through your camera and you point it at a sign in one language and in real time, in reality, it will overlay the language and the, the sign's language with whatever language you chose. So I could point it at a sign that's in Spanish and it will show me on my screen the same sign in English. Incredibly powerful. And that technology, that was, just, that was an app that I got for free on my phone. So the, the, the ability to create and consume augmented reality experiences are extremely powerful and becoming readily accessible and have fundamental applications for learning. So I encourage you to be checking, following what's going on in the augmented and virtual reality space because there's a, the bar of entry is getting to the point that it's going to hit mainstream soon. Wearable technology. How many of you have a wearable right now? A few hands. Um, wearable technology is something that is a rapidly growing um, consumer industry. Most of it's in the fitness space right now, but we're starting to see other things as well. And most of the, com most of the conversation around wearable technology the last couple of years has been around two things, Apple Watch and Google Glass. And now Google Glass, is, a lot of people are familiar with the fact that it, it's failed. And you look at this picture now and you realize that you would have to be in, in hindsight, it's almost funny that you look at this and you're like, wow, what kind of a fool would walk around with a computer strapped to their head 
Um, and, and you'd have to be foolish to be wearing something like that. Uh, but the reality is, two years ago, I, sat on, I stood on this very stage talking specifically about Google Glass. Um, and a lot of people, if you, if, you did mess, if you did Google searches on Google Glass right now, you would see that it is uh, pretty consistently referred to as a failure because Google killed the Explorer program and, and is no longer actively pursuing that. Um, I would disagree completely. I think Google Glass is one of the most successful consumer experiments in history because we discovered a lot through that program. We discovered that this device, while well, when it was here, was an extremely powerful user experience. When I put that thing on, it disappeared. It was like wearing a regular pair of glasses that, that had tremendously powerful uh, applications attached to it. But it was not in my field of vision. It was there when I needed it. I just had to peer up, but it was not, it, it was, you forgot you were wearing it. What you, what you learned on the other side was that while it wasn't distracting for me to wear it, it was extremely distracting for people to see me wearing it because there was no normalcy to it. Um, but Glass, from a lot of people don't realize glass is not dead. Glass as a consumer product at this point in time is dead. But Google just recently patented Google Glass version 2.0 and it is focusing more on enterprise because one of the things that, we dis that was discovered during this test was that while it wasn't necessarily something that was good as a consumer product, there were tremendous applications within the enterprise. The ability for someone to get real-time performance support from, Duke, from, a, from a device that you were wearing at any given point, hugely powerful. And that's where their focus is on this device just now. Making it smaller, making it more, making it more travel friendly, but focusing it on enterprise applications to give people the support that they need within the workplace. That's training. This, this, is, gonna, this is something that is maybe dead as a consumer product, but it is very much alive in the learning and development space. Not today not a year from now, but a lot, you're gonna start seeing applications of this within organizations in the next couple of years. But, it, but I don't wanna to get too far down the glass, the, the glass path, because Google Glass and Apple Watch are two very specific examples in a very, very big pool. They get the most amount of attention, but the pool around wearable technology is enormous. And, the, and wearable technology is, gonna, is emerging as a hub around a lot of the discussions that we've already been talking about. We talk about big data. A lot of the data that is going to be generated that we are able to analyze and tell stories around is coming from wearable technology. That it's, there's tremendous amounts of sensors and such that wearable technology is just generating all this data. So we understand what people are doing. There's wearable technology that can understand the difference if I take my arm and doing this and doing this. That's just a little sensor on my arm. That, you think about that in the manufacturing environment, that, Understanding the competency of what people are doing as the technology continues to advance, that it understands the little specific movements that I'm making with my arm. There are applications, if you, you want to see some, some interesting stuff, there's one of, this is one of the links that is on uh, the, the blog post I did. There's a lot of sports applications on this, where there's, there's uh, I'm a big baseball fan, and there are wear, there's wearable technology, there's a vest that a pitcher in baseball can wear that will analyze the throwing arm and after the pitcher throws 10 different, 20 pitches, whatever it happens to be, goes to a computer, looks at a report, and the computer will say, your arm angle is off by this amount, that amount. You should be tweeting this. So rather than someone watching video and looking for something, the computer is analyzing the actual throwing motion and giving them responses back. Again, that's sports, but that technology that sports is putting a lot of money behind to understand how people are performing in a sports environment is going to trickle down to change the expectations for how people learn. Wearable technology is, radical, is, is poised to radically change a lot of stuff within the consumer space, and the way that we learn is going to trickle down as well as attached to that. Questions? Yeah. Uh, it's I think it's a good question. If you didn't hear it in the back, the question was, what, was, was the problem with Google Glass the fact that the market wasn't ready? Um, partly, I think partly, I think part of it was the fact that the, the market wasn't ready. I mean, you talk about disruptive technologies. You know, I have an Apple Watch. There is a normalcy attached to me wearing a watch. There was no normalcy attached to the fact that I'm going to strap a computer to my head. Um, that, that was a very disruptive idea, and it, it also opened up, as with any new technology, it opens up a lot of conversations around privacy and things of that sort. I mean, you want to talk about a disruptive technology. I told you the fact that I put that thing on and I forgot that it was there. 
I went to a baseball game. I'm a, again, I'm a baseball fan. And I was just, oh, I wonder, wonder how this ex wearing this is going to affect my experience. And I forgot that it was there. You know, occasionally took a picture. Occasionally, when it prompted me with a notification, I saw that it is. But generally, I forgot that it was there until I walked into the men's room wearing it. I, I remembered very quickly that I was wearing it because I'm like, why is everyone looking at me weird? And I realized that, oh my God, I just walked into the men's room with a camera on my head. <laughs> oh, and like, I was, oh, okay. Uh, uh. Uh, but it's a disruptive technology. So I do think that, yes, I do think that it was too soon. Um, but I, I, I don't know this for a fact, but I believe, I, don't, I believe that the spirit of what the, Explorer, the Google Glass Explorer program was, was just that. I don't think that Google really expected this to be the next iPhone that, that was going to radically transform it. I think Google's got the money that they can say, we want to be ahead of this curve of what wearable technology is. We have the ability to put a really good test out there. And we've got stupid people like David Kelly who's willing to pay us $1,500 to be a beta tester. Um, and that's what they did. They put it out there and they said, let's, let's see what's going to happen. And they learned so much about that around what's go what works and what doesn't work. And I think that's part of, that's part of where the, the disruption comes in and where the, the normalization of wearable tech is going to play. Uh, because like, even, even something like the watch, there is normalcy attached to the fact that I am wearing a watch. But then you put it into play in terms of how it affects your daily life. And I had this for about a day and a half. And I was sitting at dinner. And if you're not familiar with the Apple Watch, essentially where it is right now is the notifications that you would get on your phone, for the most part, they get pushed to your wrist. It's, it, it will eventually be able to do more, but at a very rudimentary level, that's what it does right now. So I'm sitting at dinner one night, like a day and a half after I have it, and I'm talking to my wife as I do every single night, and all of a sudden she gets this look. You know the look that you get from a spouse. And I went, what's the matter? She goes, do you have some place to be? I said, no, why? She's like, I'm trying to have a conversation with you. I said, and I'm, I'm, we're having a conversation. What's going on, sweets? She goes, you've checked your watch four times while I'm talking to you. Because, and, and I was just looking at the notifications on my phone, but the reality is there are social normalcies attached to doing this. And if you and I were having a conversation, forget about the Apple Watch, you and I have a conversation and I do this three times, that's saying to me, I don't want to talk to you. And that's one of those things that you start to learn with, with how is this affecting normalcy. That's all got to shake out. The, the, the privacy aspect of all of these different technologies that we're talking about, these are conversations that are going to be had that are going to be shaking out on the consumer market. Uh, but I do think that the early adopting companies are testing a lot of it out. So I, don't, I think, to give you a, a very short response to the, the general question, I do think it was too soon, but I think they knew it was too soon. Any other questions? Next one. Learning and performance ecosystems. This, is a, this isn't so much a, there are technologies that back up the learning and performance ecosystem, but it's more a different approach to the way that we do things. It kind of connects the dots on all the different things. It kind of, it, the, if you're not familiar with this, this idea, the, met, the, the thought process behind a learning and performance ecosystem, it's essentially saying take the individual in the center and look at the environment that surrounds them. Not the learning programs that we put at them, but the entire environment that surrounds them that gives them support. And understanding where we can have influence, where we may not necessarily have influence, but affects that, that individual's ability to learn and perform. And how do we properly support that? It incorporates performance support. It incorporates uh, HR strategies around how do, we get, how do our managers support our people. It, 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 it talks about the culture of our organizations. It talks about the, everything that surrounds an individual within the, even the, the, the structural aspects of the workplace. Learning and, develop, learning and performance professionals are getting increasingly involved and pushed in many organizations into that larger discussion of training is one piece of a much larger pie of how someone can get supported to do their work and be successful in their work. And where does the piece, is, where, where, understanding where our sphere of influence is within that, but more importantly, understanding the complete picture and how we, uh, so that we better position the support that we provide there. There's a lot more organizations expanding the scope of what learning and performance means and what, the conversa and what conversations we need to have accordingly. It's just more, there are technologies that, that are connecting different, different pieces together in ways that enables us to better support the overall ecosystem of an organization. But this is more about a, a different approach to how we do our work. And you'll see a lot of these conversations within our space if you're paying attention. The Internet of Things. How many of you have heard about the Internet of Things? How many of you know what the Internet of Things is? 
Okay, well, it's a good, good, good amount of hands. Uh, the Internet of Things is essentially everything is connected to the Internet at a very basic level. Uh, but again, when you start connecting the nodes between big data that can analyze the information and all these different things, everything, everything is connected. We hear a lot, there's a lot of the stuff that's going on in the, in the consumer market right now. I think the, my favorite example of the Internet of Things is that a device that you stick into a plant, one of those things that monitors the, the water of the soil, and if the sensor recognizes that the plant needs water, I'm not kidding here, your plant will tweet you. <laughs> that you will get a tweet from your plant that says, hey, I need water. I want one. Because I want, I want to have to go, I want to have to justify to my wife to say, we need to set up a Twitter account for our azalea. <laughs> I want to have that conversation with my wife just to see where it goes. Um, but the Internet of Things is essentially saying that we have all these sensors that are in, in our devices now. That now it's connected in ways that we can get information from it. And that when you start thinking about the potential of Internet of Things and putting all of these different devices together, I now have a smartphone that is connected to my watch that not only can accept signals, but it can broadcast them. So, it can, so it's connected to the larger world. So we're not that far off from a world that I'm walking around with a device that is connected to a database that knows me and knows my competencies as an individual and has the ability to broadcast that in an encrypted way so that other things can understand it. So at a very trivial level, what does that look like? It looks like me walking into my house and having the, the thermostat recognize that I'm there and setting the temperature appropriately to the way I like it. Or the fact that I don't like that picture that my wife hung in the hallway and, I, and, and that's where I wanted the big, big, the big long panoramic print of, of City Field where the Mets play there, but she said no. Um, that, now that could be a digital frame, and when I walk by it, it changes and puts what I like, and then when I'm out of the hallway, it goes back to the picture that she likes. Uh, that's very trivial, but it gives you an idea of, of the idea of broadcasting. What does that mean in an organizational setting? Well, say you're in manufacturing and I walk up to a piece of equipment. I get to that piece of equipment, the, the, the piece of equipment picks up the Bluetooth signal that my device is saying that is connected to a database that knows my competencies. That machine now knows how well I know it, how to use it and can respond to me appropriately with the type of support that I need. That's not science fiction. There, that's today in a, lot of, or in a lot of industries. That has tremendous application. Where, where do we fit in in learning professionals in that paradigm? How do we support? people properly and, and develop content in a way that's appropriate to give people support in that paradigm. The Internet of Things is something that for a lot of organizations is 10, 20 years out. But on a consumer standpoint, it's starting now. You know, you, you, many of you have probably heard of the Nest thing I just mentioned a second ago. That's now. And we're starting to see more and more applications of that. And as essentially the Internet of Things is going to enable machines and individuals to be better informed that we can connect to the information that we need when we need it. That phrase, get the information that you need when you need it, that's tremendously powerful for learning and performance. So we need to be following this space. I don't think that there's a lot of applications for learning and performance in the near term with the Internet of Things, but it's going to fundamentally change the way that we live, and that will eventually trickle down to expectations for how we learn. And that's probably the most far-reaching one, but I think, we, I think we should be aware of what's going on with that. So what can we do, real quick? Um, because I've discussed a lot of different stuff, and what can we do? First thing is we, we can prepare for it. And how, what can we do now to prepare for it? Because a lot of this stuff for your organization may be five, ten years out. I think there's a number of things we do. First, plug in. And what I mean plug in, I mean just plug into the conversation. A lot of us do that by doing this. We come to conferences. And we speak to, and this is great what we do at conferences. We connect, we share, we learn from each other. But you need to plug in beyond that. You need to plug in outside of the, the learning and performance space to see what marketing agencies are doing, to see what, uh, what's going on in the technology space from a consumer market. Very, very powerful stuff. But not just plugging in and paying attention, listening. Listening appropriately to what's going on. More importantly, discussing it. Me understanding what's going on in the technology space is not nearly as powerful as if I jump into the discussion, because if I jump into the discussion, I'm bringing my world into the discussion, and that's going to get me to the point of context, and that's where the context is huge. Context, being able to take these technologies and put it into my context, to be able to ask questions about saying, well, this is my world, how does this apply to me, and have an expert say, well, it might change your world in this way. 
and to be able to build it into the context is extremely powerful. And the last thing that I encourage, which some of you touched on in the earlier thing, is to just play. You see a new technology that's out there. I'm not saying you need to use it today in your organization, but to play in the space, download a trial, go, go download an app and check it out, gives you the idea of what people are doing. It opens your mind to not what we do, but what we could be doing. And when these new technologies do become mainstream, you'll have a little bit of context from the play that you've done as to how it might apply to your world. So I encourage you, play as much as you can. It's going to help you in, your, in the work that you do. Um, I want to remind you, as we get to an end here, that you can go to that URL. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I specifically mentioned, as well as a, not, a lot of uh, other examples, uh, are available here on this blog post, um, as well as the slides, if you were interested in them for some reason. Uh, and other than that, we're just about out of time. I want to thank you for, for listening and joining me in this discussion today. This is how you can continue the discussion with me in all these different spaces. And I want to thank you all for, for spending your last session of the day with me here today. Thank you. You, you mentioned uh, technology adoption uh, as, a, as an issue, and you mentioned that some um, companies adopt it but maybe don't use it properly. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there are lots of issues we could talk about here, but could you tell us what do you think are the factors that actually influence widespread adoption of technology that is effective in a, in a workplace? Well, I think a lot of it is culture within right. an organization. Um, how we implement a learning technology is probably not going to be all that different than how we implement technologies within our organizations in general. Um, I think a lot of, I think one of the things we need to be resistant of within our organizations is the attraction of a shiny object. Um, I, I can think of numerous organizations that have thousands of tablets that are out there that are collecting dust because we should put tablets out there. We should give people, to give them the access and we'll put all of our content there and there was never a strategy. I think the, the biggest things that that hold a lot of organizations back when it comes to implementation of any technology is not pausing to ask the right questions first, to jumping to the action of how do we implement this without really taking the time to ask the right questions about should we be implementing this. So really it, it's a case of thinking, okay, what do I want to do with this mm -hmm. that's different? Uh, is it a case, I think, of adjusting also the way we um, implement learning uh, policies and learning processes in the workplace? Yeah, I, and, I, and I, it plugs back to the, the, the comment I made earlier that we, we tend to just take the new technology and apply the old methodology to it. And, and you know, how, how is this tablet going to connect to my LMS? Why do you need the tablet to do that? You can, you know, what, what are you trying to do? What problem are you trying to solve? Because no, no technology is going to, on its own, solve a problem. Yeah. It needs to, you need to put it into the context to solve the problem. And that applies to how we use it as learning professionals as well. A lot of times we get attracted to the shiny object of what we could be doing with it, but it's got to come back to why do we need it? What problem is it going to solve? What is it going to enable us to do differently than we've ever done before? I suppose it's the classic case. I'm, uh, you must have seen this where, you, where uh, a new interactive whiteboard is put on the wall. Mm -hmm. And people come in and use it the way an old whiteboard would be used by writing on it, and, and that's all they do with it. Oh yeah, uh, it's it's sad, um, but I think it's um, who, who actually has seen that in their own workplace? Let's have a show of hands. Uh, one or two, maybe half a dozen, maybe even more of you. Uh, so it's not as uncommon as we think it no. is. Any are there any questions from the floor at all? Does anyone want to ask a question? Is there one over here? Um, yeah, if you say who you are, please. Yep, David Lennon from Get Abstract. It's a short question, probably a very long answer. You started talking about artificial intelligence, and at the moment it's a friend. <laughs> I just wonder how long before it becomes a foe, you know, because it will overtake human intelligence. Jeopardy, you mentioned, but also recently Go is now beating the, the European champion of Go, which apparently is far more complex than chess. So I'm just thinking about you know, your, your take on the place of AI. Yeah, I'm, I, there's always a fear of... of you know, that the, the movie The Terminator is going to become reality, um, which it may at some point. I'm not anticipating, I don't, you know, I don't think in our lifetimes in general. Um, but I saw one of the links I believe is, is on the, the, the blog post that I saved. If not, I will edit. Um, is, a, is a flipping of the AI component, where it's not, it's not AI, it's IA, which it would, instead of being artificial intelligence, it's intelligence augmentation where it's, it's focusing less on the machine, it's focusing not on the machine making the decision, but on the machine enabling us to make better decisions. That it's, an, it's, it's a, I think machines are a tremendously powerful tool to automate the processes that humans don't need to be engaged in. 
so that a machine, anything that a machine can do that is going to reduce my workload so that I can focus on the value add that I have as an individual is extremely powerful. And that, that's, the, that's the positioning of this um, intelligence augmentation where something like Watson, Watson is not posed to make the decisions that are going to change the world, so to speak. But Watson is, is going to do the data and the analytics to provide us with the information that we need to make a contextual decision. So the idea, I think the, in the near term, the idea of artificial intelligence, where I would like to see it go, is we, ha we have these meetings that we say, we, we need to do this, we need to do this research to get this answer so that we can decide what we need to do. That we can just say to a machine, this is the question that I have, what's the answer to it? Get that data back quickly so that we can make the decision. We spend a lot of time as, as humans doing the rigor to do the research to get the data that we need to make a decision. And I think the real power of AI, or IA depending on how you're looking at it, is to enable the computer, like a Watson type of thing, to do that rigor for us so that we can get right to the decision making point. Does that answer your question? Okay, well, I think time has unfortunately beaten us once more. I, I know you don't want to be the last day in the queue for drinks, so, <laughs> so we, will, we will call a halt there. But um, I'd like to thank you, Dave, for flying thank all you. the way over the Atlantic to be with us today. My I think pleasure. it's been really worth it, hasn't it? Show him how much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.